You're the humans. They're not going back in yet, which really makes them mad. Here we go. It was not a human being. And I don't know anybody, I don't know anybody in the world that has listened to more of the human voice on tape than myself. So how many years were you actually in this field doing this type of interpretation before you were introduced to the Bigfoot tapes? Oh, um, at least 30 years. At least 30 years. Uh, and I like to say that I, I was not a Bigfoot guy. I'm just a language guy. I still say that. I mean, you know, I've had to learn a lot about the Sasquatch and his behaviors, and, mm -hmm. which linguists do have to learn a lot about your target. Cryptolinguists, we do have to learn about our, you know, the soldiers in our target language. So I've had to learn a lot on my title was cryptologic uh, um, technician interpreter in Russian and Spanish, and then also, um, which is where the two, lang the two target languages in which I went to school for. But then I was also required to uh, learn quite a bit of Persian uh, on site in the Persian Gulf mm -hmm. to do my job out there. So I, we start out sit in the cans, we call it, with that, sitting there with the headphones collecting voice communications in our target languages. I'll use it. I worked for the Naval Security Group, which is directly um, command-wise falls under the NSA. All of our information goes straight to the NSA. It doesn't go up to, through the Navy chain of command. It goes straight to, and all of our reporting goes straight to the NSA. Well, cryptolinguist, um, or cryptologist, would be someone who collects uh, the voice communications in the code and then breaks the code. <laughs> So we're talking about you getting the tapes, you have the tapes in hand, but where, what was the source of these tapes other than we know that Ron Moorhead gave you the tapes, but where did he get them? Okay, what I found out is that the, uh, the two different tapes, one was recorded by Al Berry in uh, 1972 up at the top of the Sierra Mountains in what they call the Sierra Camp. It was a... Uh, and the other tape was what I call the Moorhead tape, was recorded by Ron Moorhead in 1974. So they were spaced out by two years, but both recorded at the same place at a, um, and having been there many times, I can tell you it is on the top of the Sierra Mountains. Um, and as Ron likes to say, between Yosemite and uh, uh, Lake Tahoe. I have a question that was just generated from what you said, but sure. you, you have a tape from 72 and one from 74. Yes. Was there any discrepancy between those two tapes or did they sound rarely similar? There was uh, some difference. I believe that they were the same creatures or the same family unit, but they were different in that. Um, in Ron's tape, I believe they were trying to slow their, their utterances down to try to communicate with the humans. They were trying to actually, of course they couldn't, 
because uh, their language is so different. But I believe that they were trying to slow their, the prosody of the deliverance down. And your assumption that that's what their attempt to do is to communicate with humans, where did you conclude that part? Uh, just the fact that they were trying to slow things down. Because they were slowing things and, down. And they were, uh, they were mimicking the humans. Some people, you know, some people claim, well, how do you know uh, that they were, um, actually the humans were trying to mimic them and then they were replying back. So, because one of the questions that I get about these sounds all the time is, how do you know it's not just mimicry, some monkey up there that's mimicking the humans and it's not a real language, okay? Well, mimicry and gibberish itself implies language. And the fact that uh, on the tapes, the humans are mimicking the creatures. And then they're playing back and forth. And one of them, the female, is actually almost singing a little song. So the 72 tape, they weren't doing that? No. No, 72 tape, the, the, uh, the delivery of, of the utterances was uh, at least twice as fast as that for as that of humans and there was no real interaction between the humans no and these creatures uh well there was interaction but it was intimidation behavior by by the sasquatches if these creatures are actually sasquatches you know i can't say what they are all i know is that whatever it is it's not a human being and they're speaking in complex language Okay. So that's how that's where the tapes came from. I, I drove out to California to meet Ron and Al personally, and uh, one of the first things I said to them is, "I cannot believe that I am the first person to detect language in these sounds. I don't believe that I could be the only person ever, the first person ever to ha have discovered this." And they both they looked at each other, and they looked at me and says. Scott, we always knew. They couldn't tell me that there, that there was a language. That's why they called it chatter. That's why they called it chatter. Because they, they didn't know, know that it would be a, a language. So they called it chatter like it might be, you know, two chimps chattering back and forth. We know that they were talking to each other. Is what they told me. And this is what I, we call the berry tape, the first of the berry tapes. Uh, this is, Alan Berry was a uh, journalist, and uh, he was not a, a part of this group of hunters that had been using this camp going back into the f late 50s, early 60s. Um, and they had had this continual... Um, interaction, if you will. So they knew something was up there. So Alan, as a journalist and a scientist, decided uh, to take up, you know, in 1972, he took up a big reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, right? And so they, they got up there and they, they placed it all out at, at the camp and placed the microphone where they thought would be a good spot if they had any interaction. What I usually do is uh, I let this run for a while at what we call real time. That means the time at which it was, um, at the speed at which it was recorded. And then we'll go back and begin to manipulate it, manipulate, manipulate the speed, um, and these are the 1972. This is 1972 tape, recorded on a big reel-to-reel, -reel, right? Now, by the way, the provenance on these tapes goes back to the beginning. So there's, they've never been manipulated in any way. <coughs> now what I'll do is go back to the beginning and uh, begin to slow it down. And then we'll pick specific spots that, that sound interesting.
uh, to us, and then I will uh, show you how we, uh, the transcription method, um, as I was taught, where we isolate a sound, slow it down, and loop it over and over again. You will hear it, and then we'll, we can speed it up or slow it down to whatever uh, makes it easiest for us to recover the sounds and get it down on paper. And before I start, I'm going to I'm going to slow it down. You can see we're at 100% right now, which means real time. So I'm going to slow it down to about 50. That seems to be the the median where it begins to sound like we can understand it. Um, by the way, I can interject this right now, is that um, I often get the question, well, if they're speaking twice as fast as us, are you saying that they're twice as intelligent as us? And I, I say, no, not at all. Um, because there's a reason that they're able to speak that fast. And it's also one of the reasons why we know that it's not a human, okay? And that is because they articulate on the pant. I'm telling you this now so that you might be able to hear it, okay? Speaking on the pant means the inhale. Humans, I mean, we're able to do it, but it's very difficult for us, okay? In other words, we can go, I want, no, when, it's coffee, ta, ta, whatever. See, we can articulate, whatever. You, we can do it, but it's extremely difficult for humans. These creatures do it with ease. And hopefully you'll be able to hear that. And, and by the way, you know, just like humans, when, when we get upset or anxious, we begin speaking a lot faster. And these creatures might be, in this particular instance, might be a little bit intimidated by the humans. That's why they're speaking to each other very quickly. But it can't be the sole reason that, that it's so fast. Okay, so I slowed it down to, well, I've got 59% here. And we'll just go from there. We're going slow now. Here we go. I can do this right here, this spot right here. This is Vamho Baruhahu. You can right there, Baruhahu. You can. I can't do it. But this creature is articulating on the pant. Baruhahu. All right, Baruhahu. Much like chimpanzees and apes do that. I mean, they don't articulate like in the, uh, with language by the human definition of language, like we have here, right? But we've all heard apes and chimps, you know, hoo, 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 like this, right? So they're making sounds on the inhale as well as the exhale. <laughs> Now, as you can see, you can. I've isolated this little uh, one-second little clip. Okay, 
but their uh, the phonemes. And by the way, a phoneme is a single sound. Phoneme is a single sound. A morpheme is what we would call a syllable. We can't speak in terms of words. People always ask me, well, what word? That sounds like the word, and then talk about words. When we're doing this type of stuff, we have to use, you know, uh, linguistic terms. Because we don't know uh, what a word is. Words, even by human definition, are no notoriously impossible to define. Because they change. They change all the time. Right, so we're talking about morphemes, um, which would be a syllable, a phoneme, a, sim a single sound, or a morpheme stream, which is a complete utterance of what we might call a sentence. Okay. So, I've isolated this, I've put it on a loop, and you'll hear it, I, can, I will manipulate the speed or the porosity of deliverance. Okay. Okay, now you can hear it much easier once I've slowed it down. Now let me put it back at 100% again, and you'll hear, you can see why the layperson, like my son, Here's nothing but apes, in his mind, apes fighting or screaming at each other, right? Now it's at 100%. <laughs> you can even, even at real speed, even at real time, you can begin to hear mm -hmm. once your mind is open to the fact that this is a language you're hearing. Okay? But as you slow it down, it actually began, begins to sound like it's a, a, might be a human speaking it. Okay? But again, it's not a human that's been speeded up because that sounds entirely different than any of this. <laughs> Now I'll play this whole long utterance, and you won't hear any of that. I'm going to play this whole long utterance here uh, in real time, and you will not hear any of that without manipulating it and slowing it down. You could hear how hard it, how hard it would be naturally for a layperson to have figured that out or noticed that. It's just beyond anything uh, in their experience, right? So we'll play it a little bit further. Huh? There's, that, there's an example of that snarl, what I call a concession snarl, or sometimes terminal snarl. It comes in the middle of any, of, out of nowhere, in the middle of conversational terms or by itself. Again, right? Uh, by the way, these are things that a crypto linguist are trained to do. We are um, we are trained to open our mind, not dealing with stuff like even with stuff not dealing with stuff like this, but even with humans. When we're sitting in the cans and we're collecting, okay, or we're transcribing something, and we're trained to transcribe languages that are not our own language, that are not our target language, um, we're trained to, of course, recognize 
languages that are not, not our own. In other words, as a Russian lang linguist, if I heard something that sounded Asian, Chinese, or something like that, then I would alert, maybe they're doing something involved in something that we don't, that we're, quote, interested in. Then I would tape, I would tape that, and then I would send it to who I think would be interested in, in that specific language, okay? But then there are languages that we don't know. It's just beyond anything in our experience that we're not trained in. Then we might collect that, and then we would transcribe it according to the, the phonemes and morphemes, okay? So we're trained in recovery of the sounds no matter what language it is. Okay? So it fits right in with what we're doing here. Right here. Now, this is one of the, one of the things that, that's, um, this is a, a, an example of one of the reasons that we know it's a language. Okay, one of the things that happens in human, and when I say language, I mean, language by the human definition of language, okay? Yes, we know tigers have language, dogs have language, right? We're pretty much pretty sure dogs understand human language, and they communicate with us. We know whales, dolphins, parrots, other animals have language. Hippopotamus, elephants, we know they have language, but they don't have language by the human definition of it, where they articulate in the exact same way that humans do. Okay? These creatures do. I've isolated 36 different phonemes, okay? With a couple that are not actually phonemes, things like tooth clicks or, or tongue clicks, things like this, right? Which we believe have uh, language properties. Some humans have, some human languages actually have that. Some African Bushmen tribe use, use those right in the middle of their utterance. Okay, so we know humans do it. But these creatures are, they are articulating with an, an exactly the same apparatus that we have. The same tracheal tree, the vocal cavity with the tongue, the, the teeth, the lips, right? They make all of the same sounds as we do. We know that the, uh, the, the lesser apes cannot do it because they don't have the apparatus that would allow them to do it. I have received very few um, submissions uh, that come anywhere near uh, the clarity of these tapes. Well, anything that even comes close yeah. to what we get from the Barry Moorhead tapes. Now, early on, when I first began uh, presenting my study, um, I began um, requesting um, submissions from any of the, the uh, field researchers Anything you get, any tape you get, please send it to me. And I, if it's legitimate, if I find any linguistic value in it, I will give you an official transcript of that utterance. Okay? And so over the years, I've collected over a hundred, over a hundred of different submissions. Problem being, probably at least 75% of them are fake. That I had to, I had to, <laughs> I had to tell them, I'm sorry, but this is not, this is not the same creature. Oh, and, and another probably 20% um, are simply another creature from the woods or from the forest that is misidentified as something that might be this creature. I can tell that they're humans trying to sound like a big, hairy, wild man. When they're trying to fool me, I've had numerous 
numerous attempts to try to fool me and send in, you know, um, I, again, I can tell when it's been manipulated. I can tell. I had one guy up in Canada who, who really badmouthed me. He sent me a, uh, he sent me numerous clips, right? Um, and said it was, and was calling out his name. I don't remember his name. Dave. Dave. And he was definitely trying to sound like a proto language. Of course, me as a professional linguist, we know there's no such thing as a proto language. Okay, and uh, when I when I told him, this is a little bit smart aleck of me, but I wrote him back because I, I was quite offended by him trying to fool me in this way. And I told him, I, I says, what you have here is either uh, a complete fake, either you are faking it, or someone is hoaxing you, right? Or, and I gave him, you know, because I taught philosophy for a long time, right? So I give him the philosophical arguments. Or, you have a mentally retarded Sasquatch trying to speak like a normal Sasquatch, right? Or, the other possibility is, you have a super intelligent Sasquatch trying to sound like a mentally retarded Sasquatch to fool you, okay? But whatever you have, it's not the same as these creatures on a Barry Marhead tapes. Now, over the years, I have uh, collected a few, a few um, little clips, little snippets, right, that I do believe are very possibly come from the same type of creature. But they're very short, and they're not very good quality. I think what we have with the Barry Moorhead tapes is we... They, those guys, I didn't, I didn't collect those, but the guys who taped those uh, ran into a perfect storm. In other words, you had, you had a group of hunters who were very isolated at the Sierra camp. It takes all day to get up there, and you usually have to take a mule train to get up there. Okay. So they're isolated on top of this mountain. They're there for a week or two, during the hunting season, and they're stuck up there with these creatures in their domain. So there's bound to be a lot of interaction. At the same time, they were doing things like gutting their deer and leaving the guts out there, which we now know, a Bigfoot researcher will tell you, that they seem to uh, like uh, the innards of deer or the innards of any animal almost like it was a delicacy or something so they, the, these hunters up there began leaving these out and then they would notice they're gone why would the innards of a deer be gone on the top of the Sierra Nevadas right and then they would have things happen and this goes into some of the cool things that were happening to them up there is they would go out on a hunt and they would come back and they would find a little pile of pine cones. Pine cones that did not come from any of the surrounding trees that had been gathered up and left there for the hunters. Why is that significant? It's because the hunters, pine cones make very good fire starters. And so they, I believe the creatures had understood that the hunters wanted and needed pine cones. They would come back and there would be a pile of pine cones there for fire starter. Also, they began to notice that um, on their lean-to cabin, which the roof of which was just big, fresh uh, pine boughs 
laid over the top of the lean-to, they came back and they started to notice that there were fresh pine boughs that had been ripped off of a tree somewhere and laid on top. Almost like an exchange with them. So, and there are some other very scary things that happen up there. Here's to the big hairy wild man, whatever he may be. Yes. Fantastic. Wonderful. <laughs>
as we went back down the switchback trails and found that camel, it was sitting right in the middle of the trail with a big bite taken out of it. Wow. As if it was held like an apple. Mm -hmm. Teeth marks and everything. Um, and then the final thing, he was, he was thrown off his horse and I was way above him, I saw it happen and I saw him land in these rocks, between these rocks, and I thought he was dead. Well, so I jumped off my horse, I just ran down there, run, run, run. And he's uh, laying there, <laughs> he's, and he's not moving. Oh my God, Ron, Ron, I'm trying to see if he's even alive. I goes, Ron. And it was, by this time, it was already starting to go down. The sun was already going down. Wow. So it's, it was going to be scary here pretty quick. Ron, I'm going down the mountain, which was another five hours to get back down the mountain. Ron, I'm going for help. There's no way I can carry you down this mountain. I'm going for help. And just as I stood up to go, you, <laughs> you're not going down without me. <laughs> <laughs> he was not going to be left up on that mountain. Mm -hmm. So we went down and, and had some very strange things happen in the camp. My horse froze on a trail. Wow. Um, Do you think the horses were trying to tell you something? Uh, I think the horses were afraid of something. And after that, we started taking mule trains up, hiring mule skinners to take us up there on a mule train and, and drop us off. The first morning we woke up, once we were down, we woke up and Ron couldn't even hardly move because mm -hmm. of his fractures. And I had sat up on my side of the tent and Ron said, maybe you better go check on the horses. And right outside of my, right outside, from here to that doorway, was where the was where the forest began and the mountain begins. Right between us and that doorway was a, a dirt road that got us access into the horse camp. Okay. And I'm just sitting up, going, you know, yeah, I'll go check on the horses. We had been picketed out about um, thirty yards away from the tents. I barely sit up. And from that far away, I hear in a female voice. Mm -hmm. And it's still dark. It's five in the morning. Um, I hear, Scott! Oh, wow. I'm oh, like, my goodness. What the hell? Did you hear that one? Said, yeah, what the hell? I said, somebody just, something, something just called my name from right there. Is that Rhonda, his daughter? Did they come over? Are they out there? I said, no, there's no cars anywhere near here. Right. No headlights, no nothing. And it was right there. We realized that the day before, we had spent all day separated, Ron and I. Mm -hmm. We realized, I'm the only, Ron! Just to hear back from him, to mm -hmm. find out where he's at. Right. And he would yell, Scott! Right. So All day long. The names would have been The known. names would have been shouted out. Right. So if, if it was those creatures, that, or one of the creatures that said that to me. Mm -hmm. yes. What else could have said that to you? What else is out there? A, that what? It? a cougar? A grizzly bear? <laughs> the first time we actually made it up there, I took Stephen. Stephen mm -hmm. went with us. Mm -hmm. He was young. He was only 13, 14 at the time. And we, we decided to hike up there without horses. This is before we started using mule teams. So we had hiked the whole way. We were on, on the trail by five in the morning and we finally got into camp. Um, it was 1.30 in the afternoon, almost two. So we had barely thrown our packs off. And we're all just sitting there resting. And off about 40 yards, directly to the west, we hear a cowbell. This is so far up in the mountain that it's impossible for cows to get there in the first place. And it sounded not like a regular cowbell. It would sound like, clang, clang, clang. Three clangs. Clang, oh clang, clang. And me and Steven and Ron were all what was that? I can't tell you what it was that did this, mm, but it, 40, 40, 
yards to the west. Clang, 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 and we're arguing. She's Ron, that was not a that was not a cowbell. Mm -hmm. Less than a minute later, as we're sitting here talking about it, arguing it over over it, directly on the other side of our camp, 40 yards on the other side, the same sound. Clang, clang, clang. Wow. Very loud. Very loud. And we're like, and I said, Ron, was that a cowbell? He said, yeah, yeah, it had to be a cowbell. Sound like a cowbell. And Stephen is going, how do you get from there to there in a, in a minute and didn't clang the cowbell the whole way he ran? Even a human could not have ran from there to there right. through that terrain in that amount of time. So tell me, did you reach any conclusions with the cowbell um, sound? No, no, there's yeah, really. nothing. Mm -hmm. It begins to, you know, be highly strange. And you get to where all of these things that are happening, there is no explanation for it. There's a feeling that you have. Mm -hmm. There's a feeling you get when they're around. Ron will tell okay. you, yes, you can feel their presence. It's not like the infrasound that we talked about where yeah. you're hit with suddenly a panic. Right. Right. But it's, there is a feeling that you get. And what is that feeling? It, it, it's just, no, it's like, well, like, yeah, like you're being watched. You haven't heard anything. You haven't seen anything. It's just like we get up there, we'll throw our packs off, get unpacked, and then go, and we look, me and Ron look at each other and go, you know what? They're here. We can, I, they're you here. Feel, do you, you, do feel you feel it, Ron? And you said, yeah, yeah, I can oh. feel that. Yeah. But more often, you get up there, throw the patch down, and going, you know what? There's nothing here. And we often had the feeling that on our first day, oh, they're not going to show up this time. <laughs> they're not going to come around. One thing that consistently happened is whenever we got up there and we had the feeling that they were there, and we knew they were there, none of our equipment worked. Mm. Uh, he, the first few times, the first three or four times that we went up there, Ron carried his, his video cam up there. And I carried, I bought a top of the line voice recorder. Mm -hmm. And I would take that up and we always overdid it with lithium batteries. Mm -hmm. And we would take way more lithium batteries than we would ever need, mm -hmm. right? And we would get up there. You could put whole new batteries in there and turn it on and you could watch the battery level. Go down. Whoa, that fast. And it would drain those batteries immediately mm -hmm. whenever they were there. So Ron had put you know new batteries in his video cam when they were there. Turn it on just in case. Ooh. If we got up to the camp and we were like, oh boy, I don't feel anything. You? No, I don't feel a thing. Mm -hmm. Because once you're up there and once you feel it, you can tell the difference when you feel it and when you don't. Mm -hmm. Then any time that we were up on that camp and we knew they were not around, mm -hmm. the batteries never ran out. Yeah, exactly. Never. Yeah. So this is a question that's been posed yeah. to me. Uh -huh. Has there ever been a carcass found? Not that I know of. Mm -hmm. But there's a reason. Why? To my satisfaction, mm -hmm. as to why. It's the same reason that you never find any other large mammal carcasses mm -hmm. anywhere in the wild mm -hmm. which have died of natural causes. You'll find a dead moose that was shot right. and then lost. All right, and there's his carcass. You can tell, or, a, or an animal that was killed by a bear, mm -hmm. or a You'll never find a grizzly bear carcass that died of natural causes. You'll never find a, a black bear or a moose or any other large mammal. You would think you would. Most lowlanders would think, oh, they've got to be, hey, all you got to do is go up there and gather antlers. Yeah. Well, you'll find dead antlers, right? But you don't find a carcass. Right. Many of my friends in the research community believe that they bury their dead. Without any proof, I'm certain that they live like humans do, in clans. Wow. Wow. They live in a 
familial group in a clan, and they watch out for each other and take care of each other. And again, this is what I base a lot on, is if they have evolved over all of these thousands of years, and it has been the most important thing, the most important factor to their survival, mm -hmm. is the avoidance of humans and several practices that they would have evolved. And one of them would be, we hide, we bury our dead. Right. Heck, Neanderthal, that's a different hominid species. Mm -hmm. Neand we know Neanderthal was buried with ritual mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and ri almost religious. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we know that. Mm -hmm. So why could not another hominid species Do be doing the same thing? Right, they exactly. may, there's good evidence that a couple of, a few researchers have stumbled upon burial mounds, big burial mounds. Okay. Now, one of them, a very close friend of mine. The next logical question, well, why don't they go and dig it up? Yes. Well, weird things happen. Pull all these rocks off of this mound. Yes. Right? And they were attacked by, in a place where there were no mosquitoes. Yes. No mosquitoes. They were attacked by swarms of mosquitoes that were choking them. Has anybody mentioned that they've seen maybe a written language from them? Oh. oh. Wow. Oh. What an interesting question. Fascinating question. Yes. Isn't it great? Yeah. Yes. They have peripheral or um, coincidental Bigfoot experiences, and then they will see on the trail oh. or on a rock or something like that, sticks laid yes. out yes. almost in a runic pattern. Stick language or stick, stick. They do a lot of, with sticks. Mm. They make formations with sticks. They'll right. bend a tree down yeah. and take the tree, which no human is physically capable to mm -hmm. do. Sure. Yeah. They'll take a tree down and pull it down and, and anchor the top of the tree with a huge rock so that it creates a portal or like creates a, um, a like a rainbow or an arch. Yeah. And then you'll see big stick formations that make a big X. And some researchers will tell you, well, that means you don't go there. You don't uh, go in that direction. Yeah, yeah. Right? Or it's... Um, what they would call territorial markers, things like this. Um, but as far as the language goes, that's what they, of course, we have no clue. Mm -hmm. And I would say anybody that pretends to have a clue what right. these sticks mean. Right, you just don't know. Might be going a step too far for me. Sure. I'm I mean, sorry? If you studied them, would you, could you, like, develop some sticks? Well, I'm, no. I'm a code breaker. Yeah, that's right. I'm a code breaker. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, if I had enough. A lot of big researchers now are getting into what they call mind speak. They might see something like that, and then they will meditate or they just open themselves up mm -hmm. and they'll hear something. They'll actually hear yeah. a voice yeah. in their mind yeah. saying, well, what does this mean? You know, well, th then there's a whole, a whole huge block of researchers in the community that, that don't want to hear anything about it. Yeah. They want to believe. Well, they want a real physical. They're, they're, the still, well, they're still stuck in the idea that this is a gigantic gorilla. Yeah, I understand that they're not interested in all of the no. other. Really, the only reason that I got into it and stayed in it is because I could see that it had never been done. Right. And that the people that were qualified to do it either were not interested right. or they are very, very rare. Right. Does anybody suspect where they sleep, the Sasquatch? And there's been dozens of reports of a... Of a of a hiker or a hunter walking up on them. Oh, asleep. Oh, asleep. oh my goodness. Some of them just mm -hmm. wherever curled up on the ground somewhere, mm -hmm. inside a bush somewhere, you know. Mm -hmm. Some of them leaning up against a tree mm -hmm. like this. There was one report that I read that was very interesting to me. This female hiker walked up on a female. Mm. Bigfoot asleep with its child. Oh my goodness. The Bigfoot mm -hmm. child. Mm -hmm. And woke up and, and the female was, you know, not as aggressive and mm -hmm. looked and actually mm -hmm. even 
the witness had smiled at her. We believe that there are, they've evolved into being nocturnal. We believe that, or I believe, as many do, that they just find a place to hide to, in the bush. Um, there seems to be a really strong correlation with berries that have thorns or thorn bushes. How about in trees? Do you think they make nests oh, in yeah. trees? Um, I don't. If they do, I think they. Uh, there are not many. In fact, I don't know of any reports of okay. nests. Nests up in tree. There are a lot of reports of nests on the ground. On the ground. They're again mm -hmm. covered in teepee-like structures. Mm -hmm. I've seen several teepee-like structures. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Wow. Of varying that. sizes. Mm -hmm. Of varying sizes, and many researchers will tell you that they teep. Mm -hmm. This is the definition of culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've heard, I've heard Gigantopithecus, you know, advocates say, well, they can't have language because there's no example, there's no, um, there's no evidence of culture. <laughs> well, the definition of culture means that you, t you teach your children something. It doesn't mean you go to the symphony on Sunday, right? The, the word culture simply means that you are taught something when you were young and you pass that knowledge on to your children, to your offspring. Okay. So, language would be the first thing, of course, to define culture. Mm -hmm. And the second would be how do you survive? Where do you sleep? Right. So right. there's... There's been witnesses reports saying that they that they actually saw a grown up, an adult Sasquatch teaching a young Sasquatch how to build a teepee type structure. Wow. Wow. If one or I mean, it's not going to protect them from the elements. But it's going to protect them again from being um, observed. If one kind of Sasquatch has language, I believe that all Sasquatches have language. Yeah. Because there's, we are in a history of language, and I'm not an anthropologist, but I'm, I know a lot about history of language. We've never discovered a tribe of humans that did not have language. We've never discovered a tribe of humans that had a proto language. All language. Is complex. The reason there's no such thing as a language, uh, as a proto language, where you would have a language for important things and the rest would be sign language, mm -hmm. right? Or grunts and groans, right. and mm -hmm. like that, right? No. If you have a language, so we think that this happened very, very quickly. If you have a, if you have a word for tree, food, woman. All the things that are important to you in our your society, right? Then you would also have a word for snow, mm -hmm. wind, mm -hmm. rain. Because why would you not? And it's isolation that creates the difference in language. That's why there are 600 Native American languages. Right, right. By the way, which each one has a different word. Not, they don't share the same word, but a mm -hmm. different word for the wild man of the woods. Mm -hmm. Completely different, but they all mean the same. 